three, two, one. I want you to imagine boats gliding up the American prairie and the wondrous city built to greet them. The city's bridges lift high so ocean-going vessels can sidle up to its wharves and docks. Families stroll along the boardwalk or maybe have a picnic overlooking the inland basin where barges load and unload. The children of this city wonder, where do those boats come from? Where are they going next? Maybe someday I can hitch a ride and see the world. I grew up in this city, and we're sitting in it right here, right now. Yes, it's an imaginary city that never came to pass, but that is of little consequence. We still walk through, or likely drive through, a landscape carved out by a dream so big, it was once compared to the Panama Canal and the Great Pyramids of Giza. This is the story of the Port of Dallas. Are you confused? Maybe you should be. <laughs> yes, you are looking at an actual etching of Dallas and its river, the Trinity, but it's a bit embellished. The Trinity River does flow to the Gulf of Mexico, some 300 miles from here as the crow flies. But in Dallas, the Trinity is not usually filled with that much water or boats. Nor was it in 1892 when city leaders commissioned this clearly fraudulent panorama. <laughs> but that did not stop the Dallas Times Herald from declaring the very next year. Of the Trinity is not a possibility, it is an accomplished fact. That's the voice of Dallas-born actor William Jackson Harper, and I asked him to embody various clippings from the 130-year history of the Port of Dallas. Because although this saga is long, one voice prevails. It's the voice of the booster, the urgent salesman. The people of Dallas cannot afford in these times to let such an opportunity pass. Now, to back up a bit. When white settlers first came to North Texas, of course they wanted boats. They struggled to get out here, and they struggled even more to haul their crops to the outside world. The founder of Dallas knew what was needed. John Neely Bryan settled here in 1841 on the banks of the Trinity River, and he envisioned Dallas as a port city. Dallas historian Darwin Payne. My name is Darwin Payne. I'm a professor emeritus of communications at Southern Methodist University. Yeah. So as Payne told me, the Trinity River was very alluring. It was also, as far as navigation goes, a complete mess. The water was often very low, except when it was flooding, and the river took its time meandering to the sea. As newcomers eroded the landscape and cut down trees, the Trinity's bends and rivers filled with floating debris called snags. Enter our first hero of this saga, Snagboat Dallas of Dallas. This picture also dates to 1892. By this point, a couple of boats actually had reached Dallas from the Gulf, but they took almost a year to get here <laughs> because of all those snags. Dallas leaders needed to get serious if they were gonna have a river port. So they built snag boat Dallas of Dallas to clear the whole course of the Trinity all the way to the Gulf. It was a ton of work and they got no glory, but they cleared the way for this boat, the steamboat H.A. Harvey Jr. The whole city turned out for a parade. The front page of the Dallas Morning News was printed in red ink. The people were masked. But it was a huge day, and they declared Dallas had become a port city as a result of that. Even the city directories, like the 1901 city directory, describes Dallas as a port city. I love it. Salesman talk. Now, because... That salesman talk because not much happened boat-wise after the H.A. Harvey Jr. After all, the Trinity was still a long and winding river and still a mess. This was a problem of nature, and Dallas needed help to vanquish it. Lots of help. So Dallas convinced Congress to authorize a series of locks and dams to make the river easier to navigate. The Army Corps of Engineers actually got started on it, but eventually Congress shelved the project. Locks and dams along the river stood deserted and moss-covered. The boats on the river either rotted or fell to pieces in the water or were sent by their owners to happier rivers where navigation already existed. Dang. 
Dallas seemed doomed to be forever landlocked. And cover your ears now because our salesman is about to get really grumpy. And just as it had done before the white man came to Texas and wrested an empire from the wilderness, the Trinity River, muddy, unclean, and turtle infested, wound sluggishly between its banks in sullen victory. Oh, turtles. All right, well, to pick up our saga, the Trinity may have been turtle infested, but it was not always sluggish. In 1908, the river overflowed its banks in a big way. And that event opens the door to our next chapter. Darwin Payne says the flood forced Dallas in a new direction. It devastated the city. And as a result of that, Dallas hired George Kessler to create what was known as the Kessler Plan. Yes, like, shout out for George Kessler. Kessler was an urban planner, and his idea was to change the whole course of the Trinity as it meandered through Dallas. Even if you live here, it's hard to imagine exactly what this means. So take a look. Here is the original course of the Trinity River as it went through Dallas. Here is Kessler's new course for the river in orange. Levees a half mile apart would wall off the new channel and open up miles of floodplain for development. Okay, so just to be clear, we actually did this part starting in 1928. We moved the whole river, 10 miles of it. This is the part that got compared to the Panama Canal. And this is what we now call the Trinity River in Dallas, this artificial waterway. The old river channel is kind of buried, or it shows up as a large drainage ditch behind the crate and barrel outlet. It's mostly forgotten. <laughs> it's fun to go look for it, though. Make no mistake, though, we moved 10 miles of river because of flood control, but the historical record shows Dallas leaders also saw this project as the resurrection of the Port of Dallas. After all, the new river channel would be perfect for the wide commercial barges that had replaced steamboats. So in 1930, we have another celebration of Dallas's nautical prospects. A bottle containing the sweet, sweet waters of the Gulf of Mexico was smashed over a dredging machine. A local pastor gave the benediction. May these engineers envision see the coming millions who our virgin acres are upturned to the smiles of God and our fabulous resources developed shall people this empire. Yes. I think we're going to get it. We're going to get a port. <laughs> Though, remember, we fixed 10 miles, but there's still hundreds of miles more of winding Trinity that are still a mess for boats. To fix that, we need the federal government. But Washington is so distracted now. There's f this Great Depression thing, and then there's World War II. OK, finally, it's the 1950s. Good times. Here's a cheerful brochure from the Trinity Improvement Association in 1957. I'm a little worried about that guy with the candelabra there. But um, the point is, now North Texas has united around this port idea. We've gotten the Army Corps of Engineers to come up with a really big plan to turn the whole course of the Trinity into a barge canal all the way to the Gulf. In October of 1963, President Kennedy authorized $900 million for the plan. Then he came to Dallas. Yeah, um, you'd think Kennedy's death here would have put a dent in the Trinity plan. Not so. Not so at all. Because now there was a Texan in the White House. And President Lyndon Johnson loved the canal idea. He also talked on the phone a lot, and he recorded everything. Here he is in 1968 with Fort Worth Congressman Jim Wright. Say, did we get, we got your Trinity thing set up? Sure here. as hell did, and I think we're on, uh, we're working on the thing. Well, now. I guess that'll be the major cronyism of the campaign. Well, I, I, I hope it doesn't hurt you. Uh, it sure as hell helps the rest of us. It's the late 1960s. We've waited, waited more than a century. There's still a lot of political wheeling and dealing going on, but we're getting ready. New freeway bridges in Dallas are now built extra tall to accommodate ocean-going vessels. Most bridges are constructed 15 to 20 feet above existing terrain, while these two high-rise viaducts rise to well over 60 feet. One reason is so they may handle the hoped-for and sought-after barge traffic the Trinity proponents claim will pour into the Dallas-Fort Worth area. I-45, not making this up. Okay, so far, Dallas has been following a familiar trajectory, right? 
think Hoover Dam, reversal of the Chicago River, all the big destructive engineering projects of our time. <laughs> but then the port of Dallas hit a snag, so to speak. The great irony is that while all of this was taking place in the early 1970s, Dallas and Fort Worth were building an international airport. That's Rob Tranchin, who made a great film for KERA called Living with the Trinity. See, by the 1970s, Dallas had changed. The new money came from banking, insurance, technology. Those people didn't need barges to reach the outside world. They had an airport. And they voted. In 1972, they elected a guy to Congress who was against the canal, and he joined forces with environmentalists. Environmentalists hated the canal because of, you know, how it would destroy hundreds and hundreds of miles of natural animal habitat. Um, they were basically turtle lovers. In 1973, <laughs> Port of Dallas backers decided to shut all this nonsense down. They called for a voter referendum on the canal. They just knew they would win. They lost. And that, that was pretty much it. No political mandate, no port. I mean, nobody thought that the Trinity River would not become a barge canal. Nobody. Now, I and many of us here grew up in the world that nobody built. The, year, the scars of the port dream remained, but the idea of it couldn't be forgotten fast enough, and the river was basically forgotten too. When I was a kid in Dallas, the Trinity was a mystery, a walled-off chasm so dark and so dangerous that bridges rose high above the trees to avoid it. I would never go there. Snags at uh, 12 o'clock. So of course I had to go there. I got into a canoe. Even an amateur like me could finally do something like this now because of all the folks who've been working so hard to make this man-made man-neglected river and bring it back to life. The Audubon Society, as you may know, leads river tours through what we now call the Great Trinity Forest, a place that was once intended to be a turning basin for barges. <sighs> Enough of that. I confess, um, oops, I don't actually like going into a boat. You know what I like? Weird landscapes shaped by unexplained historical factors. Thank you, Dallas. Now, I understand why most of us don't know the history of the Port of Dallas. It didn't end up the way it was supposed to. And a salesman, it's a sales story. If you can't sell it, you shouldn't talk about it, right? Salesmen can't afford to talk about failure. But we need this story if we're ever going to figure out how to live with the river today. We need to find a usable past. So I'm going to suggest these guys. They're not selling a future that may never come. They just had a job. They made order of chaos, one slimy log at a time. They're our model as we dive into the dirty debris of our history. There are stories like this, honestly, everywhere that need sorting. I'll be out in the lobby if you want to talk with me and a librarian from the Dallas Public Library. Get out there, pick your snag and be kind to the turtles, thank you.